All right. Hello, everyone. We're here today with Lily with Monitor Base and Bobby. So, Bobby, I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself today. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I'm Bobby. I'm the COO of Monitor Base. Um, I've been I've been working here really kind of from the beginning of the company. Um, I was kind of like the first employee, so uh, just been around for for a long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so today we're going to be talking with Bobby about cooking because Bobby is an incredible chef and I'm always blown away every time that I talk to him. I could talk about food forever with anybody, but especially with Bobby because all the food he talks about is somehow even more magical than I could <laughs> make it ever seem to be. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to start off with a, a question, kind of an introductory question. How did you get into cooking in the mm. first place? So I, um, when I was a little kid, I was really, really picky, just like I would hardly eat anything. Um, and for the longest time, like my mom refused to like make me any other food if I, if I didn't eat whatever she made. So I would either like make myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or, um, or I would just you know, that was pretty much my only other option. But when she started, she started having me um, come and like help her cook in the kitchen. And I was like excited to do that because, you know, it seemed like something, I don't know, more fun to do. Um, and like get to like, I don't know, chop vegetables with knives and like cook on the <laughs> stuff that was really fun to me. So I, um, I started doing that. And then in doing that, I think I, I don't know what it was just like seeing how everything was made. I was like, okay, I'll try that. I'll, I'll eat that, you know? And so then I became less and less picky over time as I was like eating new things and like cooking those things. And, um, and then that just became something I was, I really, really liked and kept doing. So how old were you when your mom invited you into the kitchen? Would you say? Oh my gosh. I, I remember standing on a chair and like cutting vegetables so i must have been like maybe like six or seven i guess I, I remember being like yeah really little and having to stand on a chair in order to like chop up like an onion or something so like, yeah i was really young what were the things you were most picky about if you said you were a picky eater it sounded like you really like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches yes is there anything you absolutely disliked i disliked um i actually didn't really like meat at all. I hardly ate any meat except for hot dogs for some reason. Um, <laughs> like the, worst, the worst kind of meat. Uh, that was the only one that I liked. Um, and I didn't like any sauces for some reason. Anything that had a sauce, I didn't want it. If I had like um, spaghetti, I just wanted the noodles with like Parmesan on it or like, well, so, um, I don't know what it was about. I think it was anything that I, that wasn't very like apparent what was in it. You know what I mean? So like okay. mm -hmm. if there were a lot of things mixed together, I, it freaked me out. But if it was something that I could really see what it is, then I was okay with it. I, I don't know. No, that kind of makes sense. And then cooking, you obviously get to see everything that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think maybe I, built your trust. Exactly. I think I was a bit of a control freak even when I was like six years old. So if I didn't know what was going into it, I just didn't trust anybody or something. I think that was probably what it was. <laughs> okay, that's hilarious. Um, was your mom, was she a good cook? I mean, I didn't go with that kind of... Yes. a lot of pressure on you to answer a certain <laughs> way, but... I can't say anything other than yes, but yeah, she, she was a really good cook. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I figured, I figured as much, but I had to ask. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. All right. So what are your favorite types of food to cook? Mm. And, and with a, before you answer, is that different from your favorite kind of foods to actually consume? To eat? I, uh, I think my favorite thing to cook is probably, um, like pasta just in general. I just, I don't know. I think like, I also really love wine. So 
it's just a, you know, they go together, they work together. Um, so that also means like having wine if I'm making pasta. So I think that's part of the reason I, I love pasta so much. Um, my favorite thing to eat though is probably sushi. I just can't, I can't make it very well. Like I could, I could try my entire life and never be able to make it as well as like someone that's really good at making sushi. And so um, that's probably my favorite thing. But yeah, favorite thing to make is probably pasta. What is it about sushi that's so hard to make? And I'm not trying to say that like cynically. I don't <laughs> like sushi personally. And I know that really? to some people that sounds like a sin, but I'm not a fan of sushi. So I'm just curious. There are so many things. Um, there's a lot to do with um, just the rice itself. So like the rice, if it's like a really great sushi restaurant, there there's so much work that goes really into like every single ingredient that they produce. Um, and one of the things is the rice, like it has to be kept at a perfect temperature, has to have like a perfect um, like hydration so that it doesn't get too sticky, but it also isn't just like falling apart because it needs to be able to hold together somewhat. Um, and then like just slicing the fish, it sounds really simple, but it has to be sliced in like certain ways in order for it to be like tender. Because if you slice it, you know, especially with different kinds of fish, if you slice it the wrong way, the fibers might be too long, it'll be really hard to chew or, you know, there's a million different things. Um, and there's so many different like ingredients in just like one, you know, sushi roll or pizza nigiri or whatever that you have, you would have to go and like make each thing and it would take forever to like really like put it all together or you could just go to a sushi restaurant and they have it all ready to go so you know it's like it's for me it's the same as like baking sourdough bread it's like i could bake i can bake a loaf of sourdough bread but it's not nearly as good as the people that bake a thousand loaves of sourdough bread every day and I can just go and get sourdough bread for like four dollars so <laughs> I'm just gonna do that you know what I mean and it's not gonna be a, a two week plus long process yes no truly <laughs> it, it takes so much time and even once you have the start yeah it's like a whole day of just folding your dough and yeah, it's a ton of work for a four dollar loaf of bread so <laughs> Okay, no, that sushi answer was very helpful because I genuinely did not realize, especially about the rice or the fish slicing, I had no idea that those were such particular practices. And it makes sense. Obviously, any craft can be um, very fine-tuned and um, up to that kind of level, but I, I didn't know, so I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, and back to pasta. Well, first of all, let's, let's clarify that you make your pasta from scratch. Yes. Um, and I mean, you mentioned the fact that it goes, it pairs well with wine. Um, mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite pasta dishes or pasta noodles? Um, I, I think it depends. So like, um, just if we're making something very like quickly or like on like a weeknight, um, I really like, um, there's a couple, there's like a few that are like weeknight pastas to make because they're really quick. And there's some that I would like only really make on a weekend because it's more of like a project. So a weeknight one would be like puttanesca, which we really like. And, and another one is cacio e pepe. The, those two specifically are weeknight ones because um, if we like get home and we don't have anything in our fridge, those are things that like just all the ingredients to those dishes just live in your pantry. So you like, we always have the stuff to make those. Um, so it's like a jar of tomatoes and um, like anchovies and olives and capers. So like super like stuff that I don't know, we just always have in our pantry or fridge. And um, so it's super easy and fast to like whip up on a weekend. Um, like, I feel like every Sunday for us is like our cooking day. So we'll, like, we'll just spend all day making something. Um, and we like to, we just, I don't know why, but we really enjoy making stuff. It just takes a lot of like manual work for some reason. So we'll, 
we will make like uh, different stuffed pastas. So um, we really like one. It's called Casunse Alimpanzana. It's like a, it's like a ravioli, but the stuffing is roasted um, beets and potatoes. And oh, that sounds so good. Yeah, it's it's kind of like sweet, but then you like toss that with um, ground butter and um, like poppy seeds, and then some like cinnamon. And it, yeah. am I wrong in saying that you have this recipe posted on your on your blog? I think yes. I think I, I think I do have that one. I most I've mostly gotten a lot of the like very I don't know the recipes that we make a lot of already posted. So yeah, I think that one's up there. We'll talk more about the blog later, but Bobby does have a cooking blog that has beautiful recipes on there that will just make you want to drown yourself in all this delicious food. Um, <laughs> but that that just does sound really delicious. I know I interrupted you, so you were talking about that one. Are there any other weekend pastas that are your favorites? Um, ooh, what other ones? Um, there's... Uh, like one that's really good. So that's one like maybe I'd make in the summer when we have like the fresh vegetables, like the beets and everything. Um, for, oh, for, are you, do you make, do you grow your own vegetables or are you just oh, saying you have them fresh because they're in season? Yeah. yeah just because okay. just they're in season or like my, my mom is like an amazing, um, gardener. So we'll go and like steal vegetables from her or, um, yeah, just, just to get things that are in season. Um, in the winter, one that we'll make is um, it's called Capoletti on Brodo. So it's like um, it's a stuffed pasta that looks they look like these little hats kind of, which is like Capoletti means little hat. Um, they look like these little hats, and you just make like a really rich um, like meat broth, and then you like cook, and then the the pastas are filled with like ground like pork and different things and then you cook those and then you just put them in your your like really rich broth so like in the winter that's like it will like heal you if you're like <laughs> water. It's seriously like because the broth is so like rich and flavorful and yeah it's so good that's definitely like a winter project and that one takes a long time because making the little like Capoletti's takes forever because they're kind of like difficult to make and like if you're making a for that one since the broth is like such a big part of it it's really good to like make one from scratch and then that takes like hours just to, for it to like boil and then you have to purify it and so yeah that one's definitely like a full day project well and you have to cook the meat that you're gonna stuff yeah into the pasta yeah it's yeah lots of steps <laughs> that sounds worth it though you also okay backtracking a little bit to the pastas that you mentioned for the weekdays you talked about them and the general ingredients but what do those kind of pastas look like for somebody who doesn't you know understand maybe the nuances of the different types of pastas okay um so both of those both of those are ones where i would use um like dried pasta so stuff that's like pre-made from the store. I like, cause I, I don't make fresh pasta every single, every single time we make it. And sometimes I actually think it's better to use the dried for different, like certain recipes. Um, so like puttanesca, for instance, that one is, um, it's kind of slightly like tomatoey for like the sauce. It's kind of like a mixture of tomatoes and olives and, um, capers and then there's also some anchovies in there but it doesn't taste fishy it, it they, those just like add like a saltiness to it um and and can you, oh it, it cut out for just a second on the last sentence that you said oh i just uh, and, and it also has uh like a lot of olive oil in, in that one okay Do, can you use any type of uh actual pasta for that yeah you could you could use pretty much anything with that. So like the, just choosing which type of pasta to to use for like the dish you're making kind of depends on the sauce that you're having with it. So like if it's, um, if it's like a sauce like a bolognese for instance, which is like a, a rich like meat sauce, that's really good with tubes 
because like I need tube pasta, it's gonna like pull that sauce inside the tube and it kind of like holds onto it really well. Um, and, but then if it's something that um, has more like, and also bolognese is very like homogenous. So it, it makes sense because it'll pull into the tubes and if you get a bite of that, you get like all the flavors at once. Um, other things that have more like pieces of things in it, right? So like pieces of olives and pieces of capers and all these, you know, chunks of tomato. Um, mm -hmm. Those would be better with like a long noodle. So like spaghetti or bucatini or, you know, linguine or whatever. Um, just because like when you twirl, like twist that with your fork, you'll be able to like capture all those other pieces, right? Um, so yeah, that's, is that, is that kind of what you're asking? Kind of like how to choose which one to use? Yeah, that was very helpful. Yeah. I never, it, it's something that you don't really think of too often. Uh, yeah. Just those little nuances of eating pasta, but they can be very important. Um, mm -hmm. I had an Italian friend who taught me how to eat long pasta noodles because usually I would just take my bowl and I'd kind of stick my fork into the middle and yeah. maybe I'd use a spoon to twirl it against, but I would mm -hmm. just, you know, go right in there and grab it and start twirling, but it kind of piles up into this giant mound if you have like a full bowl. Yep. And so she taught me to just take the like edge, the corner of the fork and just lift out a couple noodles and then pull those out all the way and then twirl them against your spoon where yeah. they still twirl properly, but they don't make a giant mound. And it's such a simple trick, but it, this was just a couple years ago. It blew my mind because I was like, oh my goodness. Okay. That makes it so much easier. Yeah. Um, and it's the same so, if you're like um, serving it in like a bowl. So like um, rather than just kind of like, you know, picking some up and like dropping it in a bowl, it looks kind of messy. Like if you do kind of the same thing, but you use like a really big, um, like, uh, you know, like the carving fork, like the two time. Yes. Fork. Yes. You, that, you just like pull it up and then like twist it. And then it makes like this, it looks like a little like mess, you know, but it's the same yes. thing with like a bigger fork. So you can get like a whole bowl of pasta. We're kind of getting into the art of, which I have to, I have to imagine. Um, I feel that you're a very art kind of, you appreciate beauty in a lot of yeah. different ways in the world. So I have to imagine there's an, uh, an art element to food for you. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Or uh, is that something you'd like to touch on? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, um, I think, you know, it's, it just takes like one or a couple extra steps to make it like both really beautiful and as well as delicious. So like doing, the, and, it, and it usually doesn't take, you know, really any extra work or any extra ingredients or whatever. It's just like, if you know, like the couple little things to do, then it's gonna like look really nice. And especially I think, I don't know, like whenever you have someone over for dinner, I think that's one of the things you want to like give them something and then be like, oh my gosh, this looks so good, right? And, yes. and like, how do you elevate it beyond like something they might make for themselves just on like a Wednesday night to, to be something that's like really beautiful. And um, and uh, I think, I don't know, that's that's one of the ways to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Do you have yeah. any go-to garnishing tips for mm. anybody that if they just do this one extra thing, on yeah. whatever dish, it's going to make a difference. Ooh, that's a good question. I think, um, oh, wow. It, 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 it depends. It changes so differently for each thing. Like, I think the more times you cook any given dish, you kind of start figuring out the little things you can do to make it like look better or everything to like work better together. Um, with pasta, that's a big one. Like, one of my pet peeves is when you like, get a bowl of pasta and it's just like the plain noodles with just like sauce, like poured on top of it. Mm, mm -hmm. um, that totally drives me crazy. Um, and it's because the pasta is so much better if you finish cooking it in the sauce itself. Um, so if that was my one tip of like, you know, we'll just sticking with pasta cause I could like get into all kinds of different foods with that, but sticking with pasta, <laughs> 
cook the pasta in the water, which is salted, first of all, really heavily salted water, and pull it out while it's still kind of chewy. You still have that like kind of like, it almost will like break. And then finish cooking it in the sauce. It's going to be like infinitely better because the sauce is actually soaking into the noodles itself. And um, it all it all becomes more of like a, a united thing rather than like dry noodles with just sauce. And it also looks way better too. So that's, okay, that, that's probably my one. <laughs> I love that. That's actually very helpful. And do you also just put in a little bit of pasta water into that uh, yes. mixture? Okay. Yeah. Yes, that. Thank you. That's a great reminder. So yeah, almost always when you're finishing the pasta in the in the sauce, yeah, just put. You want to keep maybe like a cup or half a cup of the pasta water because it's so full of starch. The water it's like literally foggy because there's so much starch in it. And so if you're like finishing cooking the pasta in the sauce and it's not like pulling together and the sauce doesn't seem to be sticking to the noodles. You can pour some of that in, maybe to like start with like a quarter cup or something. And you just keep cooking it. And the water, it, at first, it's going to look way too liquidy. And you're going to think that I'm crazy. But the, <laughs> if you keep cooking it, the water will just evaporate out and the starch will make everything cling together. And it, it, it happens really quickly, like probably within like five minutes or something, it's going to be like fully done. You know what? I feel like these tips could help un- elevate any pasta dish, even if it's the most plain jar of pasta sauce and regular spaghetti wow. noodles. I do the same so, stuff with macaroni and cheese. Like I do <laughs> exactly the same with macaroni and cheese. So yes, it totally won. So I love it. And it just brings a little bit more excitement to it. Even if it is just macaroni and cheese, you feel yeah. like, you know, you're putting in the extra effort, a little extra love. Yeah. Um, I love it. Okay. I have another question. Let's see. What are some foods that maybe you didn't used to like before, but that you've gotten that acquired taste to like? I, there's so many like, like little ones, like obviously cheese. I think anything that was strongly flavored when I was a kid, I was like, I don't want that. But slowly I've grown to like it. So cheese was a big one. I would only eat, I think most, uh, you know, American kids grew up on like medium cheddar cheese. Yeah. (laughs) I think everyone, it was on like your quesadillas. It was on like your sandwiches, whatever. Everything. Um, Everything. Medium cheddar cheese. So, um, definitely more cheeses. I, I like acquired a taste for, or just like things like sour cream or whatever. For some reason, those all freaked me out when I was a kid. Really? <laughs> That's so funny to me. Yeah. Uh, so those for sure. And then anything um, fermented. So like kimchi or like sauerkraut or um, pickles, I was always pretty okay with. But um, yeah, de- like anything else fermented, I guess cheese is really kind of in that category as well. Um, I used to think that was disgusting, but now I like really crave that. And like my wife makes fun of me because I'll eat like a big spoonful just of like sauerkraut because <laughs> delicious and I'll just like if I have like a rich meal or something I'll just have a big spoonful of sh- sauerkraut because it's like so it's good, like acidity <laughs> I love that I'm, I'm not sure that I'm quite to that level I probably need to work on my tolerance for that <laughs> sort of food or my acquired taste yeah but I am I'm in love with cheese so I I want to know your favorite kind of cheese or uh, maybe that's too narrow. I think if it were me, I'd have to give at least a top five. So what are your favorite cheeses? Favorite cheeses. Um, My favorite, um, probably my very favorite is uh, Comte. It's like a French Gruyere. I I never can pronounce that correctly. You could probably. Yeah, you you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Comte is probably my favorite. Super like nutty and delicious. Um, it's so good. It's so good. Um, I also really like Latour, which is like a soft cheese, a bloomy rind cheese. It's It smells terrible, um, but it's really, really good. It's super creamy. Um, what other ones? I really like, um, there's this one called Alta Badia. It's from 
uh, grown in like the Alps and it tastes um, the like cows that make that cheese that eat a lot of just like wild alpine like flowers and herbs and stuff that grow in the Alps. So it, it tastes a little bit like flowers, weirdly. Um, really? Yeah, that one's really That's good. so interesting. Okay. I'm going to have to take notes on these cheeses because I, I I'm not familiar with the last two that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both so good. Those are your top three? My top three, yeah. All right. Yeah. So good. I, mean, um, including, I feel like like Parmesan's a given, so I'm not going to include that one. And um, yeah, those are my top four. Par I mean, that's just like, that's a given. It has to be in there. Right, yeah. Especially when we're talking about pasta. Yeah. The third type of cheese, the floury one, mm -hmm. is that a soft cheese or is it more firm? That one's hard, yeah. Okay. More firm. And um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. It has like a little like bitterness to it, but and that's kind of like that floralness. But yeah, super good. Oh, I love cheese. Are you a fan of blue cheese? Like, um, like do you like like Rockfort or things like that? Yeah. That so, one's very strong. So Yeah, Rockford's super strong. I do like some. It's not something that I eat a lot. Usually if I'm gonna have it, I'm having it with something else. So like um like certain pairings of it. So like that with like pears and like walnuts or something is really good. Um or like the classic ones are like with um figs and like you know, like prosciutto or whatever, that's also super good. It's, I don't know, it's not something I really like to eat just on its own, just because it's like so, it can be so like overpowering. It's like, you know, like almost like burns your sinuses if it's like really powerful, like a rock fridge or something. But um, yeah, yeah, it's, I, I like it in certain occasions. That, that's my answer on that. Okay, that's fair. That's very fair. Yeah. Okay, here is a good question what are your top five? I, and I say five, it's kind of a rough number. If you had to extend it to six or lower it, that's fine. But mm -hmm. cooking utensils or cookware that mm -hmm. are your essentials. Okay. Um, okay. I think number one is um, a chef knife. So that's like probably like an eight inch chef knife. Um, I think and what's key about it being a chef knife is it has like the taller back of the knife so when you're like chopping quickly you're not like hitting your knuckles on the uh, cutting board a bunch um that's like really i feel like if people only had like one knife that they could just have that and they'd be fine um like if it's sharp enough like people are always one of my other pet peeves is like using um serrated knives on like a tomato or something absolutely do not need that if your like chef knife is sharp you you won't need like a serrated knife at all um and you can that that could be your only knife and you'd be pretty much fine it can really do everything um and also the nice thing about like the thickness of it or like the the height of the knife is if you're like chopping like onions or whatever you can use it to kind of like shovel everything up into your pan you know mm -hmm. um so that's number one uh my second one is um, like a Staub um, cast iron pan. Um, I really like the Staub cast iron pans because they have like an enamel coating on the inside. So you don't have, you can like wash it with like soap and water. You don't have to worry about losing your seasoning. Um, so that's really, really nice. Um, is that what you cook your sourdoughs in as well? Yes. Well, so uh, that that would be in like the Staub cast iron like Dutch oven. Um, I'm saying like a Staub, and that's my. That was gonna say that was my third one. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, this would be like a frying, like a Staub frying pan. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Got and it, got it. It's thick enough, like cast iron. It's thick, so you can like sear like chicken or beef or whatever like you could cook a steak in it like i live in a condo so i, I don't i don't have like a grill so like if i'm cooking like a steak it's in the cast iron pan. um but then the enamel is like smooth enough that you could cook like an egg if you like fry an egg in it and it's not gonna like stick or anything 
Um, so that is amazing. I have like a whole nice. set of, you know, normal metal pans, like stainless steel pans, but I honestly, I like rarely use them. I pretty much only ever use my stop pans, pan in pot because they're just so amazing. Um, and so, yeah, my third one would be the Staub Dutch oven, um, or like cocote is what it's called. Um, cause yeah, you can like cook bread in it. You can like cook like roasts in it and it's amazing. Like you, you can be like cooking with it on the stove and then just like put it in the oven to finish. Same with the cast iron or the frying pan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I probably use it like almost every single day and, um, my fourth one is probably a, um, probably just like a wooden spoon. That's probably my number four. That and makes my, sense. That's right? so funny. I mean, it makes perfect sense. You just need one. Yeah. But I don't know. Somehow that surprised me. I was like, oh yeah, I guess you do need that. Yeah. It seems like a given, right? But it like, I'm like, what are the, if you could only have five things, and you could cook pretty much everything, that would be one of those things, you know? Um, yeah, wooden right. spoon. And my fifth one, okay, I'm gonna do six. I'm gonna do six. All right, that's perfect. And I'm gonna assume like a baking sheet is a given. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay, that's a given. My fifth one then would just be like a fish spatula. It's just like a spatula, but it's super, super thin and it's really easy to get under stuff. And my sixth one, is a sill pat. Have you ever used one of these? So are they the silicone? Yes. Like liners? Yes. Those okay. are amazing. Yeah. Like I use that all the time, like probably every other day or something. Anytime I'm roasting every, anything, I use that because um, a lot of times when you're roasting stuff, you want to get like the browned, like crispiness on like your potatoes or whatever. And that you will get it every single time without fail. It is like amazing. Cause a lot of times what happens is if you're just cooking on a cookie sheet, even if it's like a nonstick one, it'll roast on there. And then when you try to like pull it off, the browned part sticks to the pan and then you're just, you lose the best part. You know what I mean? But with a pat, it never happens. It's amazing. It's the best. Yeah. Okay, that is honestly a very good list. And I was most surprised by, I guess, the wooden spoon, even though that shouldn't be surprising, and the silicone pat. What yeah. what do you call that? Sil uh, pat? Yeah, 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 sil pat. Okay, Most I should get one. I'm going to give you one more. My seventh would be <laughs> a microplane, because it's like anything, like zesting anything, or like grating Parmesan or whatever. Microplane, amazing. Or That's garlic, what, even. Or garlic, yes. It's the How best. do you normally prepare your garlic? Do you chop it? Do you uh, plop it in things whole and give it a smush? <laughs> what do you? What is your I like that. preferred uh, garlic method? Uh, it depends. So, like, garlic is super interesting because it can taste so different depending on how you prepare it. So, the more you like grate it or chop it or mess with it at all, the more it releases. Um, it's this chemical called allicin and it's, it can be really, really powerful. So unless you're like, uh, so if you're just going to like grate gar garlic into something, it's going to strong, it's going to taste really, really strong. Even if you just use like one clove, um, unless you cook it, when you cook it, it like mellows it out big time. Um, but like if you just cook garlic whole without chopping it up at all, it'll be really, really sweet, weirdly. So like if I'm roasting it with like some chicken or something, I might just like cut it in half and put it in because that's going to just make it like sweet and really nice. If it's going to go into like a sauce, then I'll probably grate it and then cook it to, yeah, to make it so that it's not like super, super strong. But then you also aren't going to like bite into like a big chunk of garlic. You know? Right. <laughs> okay. That's fair. That's really interesting. I had no idea about that um, chemical in garlic. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is an unpopular food or cooking opinion that you have? It could be on anything. Okay, I know. I like immediately know exactly the one. <laughs> my, this drives my wife insane because she hates this so much. Um, I really, really like on like a cheeseburger. 
I really like American cheese, like the fake, like craft <laughs> American cheese. It is the best cheese for a cheeseburger, in my opinion, because it melts so like perfectly. And it like, if you put it on the cheeseburger when it's in the pan, it'll like get brown and crispy on the parts that touches the pan. It's amazing. It's so good. So it's like fake cheese. And I know that that's terrible, but on a cheeseburger, I love it. But my, my wife cannot stand it. Whenever we make like cheeseburgers, <laughs> we get her like separate cheese for hers. Um, what yeah. does she get? Does she get like Swiss or just cheddar? She'll she'll get like pepper jack or something. Or okay. or she'll also do like goat cheese, which is like it's good, but I just want like that diner like cheeseburger. You know what I mean? With like yes. the, like melty cheese. Yeah. Right. I'm I'm with you on that. Although yeah. I will say one time this was when I was living in France and I don't know why, but we had American cheese in our fridge and we had it from the time that I moved into that apartment. It was already there. I have no idea how long it was there for. And then yep. I lived there for about six months and it, it looked no different. It, it's it was a little bit scary, but that's it, okay. It is really scary. Yeah. It, that is <laughs> that still weird. To me. I have like American cheese in my fridge that's probably been in there for like a year or something, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really scary. And it's the same with whenever you buy cheese in like those pre grated bags, it's the same. Like those can last forever and ever. And yeah. Ever. That's so, so true. <laughs> but i'm not hating on it because I, I agree with you i love the american cheese on cheeseburgers it's really yeah. good yeah <laughs> that's so funny i love that your wife is uh very opposed to it yeah majorly <laughs> okay I, I, this, I do. sorry what were you saying I, I was like it's like, like the thing i do that bothers her more than like anything else probably every single <laughs> thing it's disgusting i'm like i agree but it's also really good <laughs> well i think there's a lot of people that agree with you luckily on that one you're yeah. not alone yep. you're not alone okay this is an important question because because it's an important question <laughs> okay mm. how do you grocery shop and mm. how do you prepare your meals how often do you grocery shop and what are your kind of your, your staples like I'm sure you have a process for this with as much as you cook. So I'm yes. curious to know. Yes. So before, like before COVID, we would go, I mean, we would plan out like our groceries usually on like Sunday night or something. And then like Monday after work, I'd go and just, you know, we'd make like a list for like what meals we're going to make that week. So we would decide what recipes we want to make, make a list. And then Monday night, I would usually go and like, pick it all up but with covid i started doing like the online ordering through like smiths or through like you can do it from like whole foods on amazon mm -hmm. and that is amazing i will never go back ever again because <laughs> you can just like it was the same amount of work we were doing right you just you sit down and instead of like writing out your list you just make a list in your shopping cart on like smiths or whole foods or whatever and you just drive and pick it up or like whole foods will just like bring it to you like the next day for free it's amazing for free whole foods yeah. does that for free yeah. yeah if your order's over like 30 dollars, they just bring it to you for free oh that's wow amazing. yeah um so that's that's how we do that i will never change it's so awesome and um they like you can even put notes of like if you're getting a tomato, I want it like this. And they do like a pretty good job. It's, I really, really like it. Um, sometimes, um, and that's usually like what we'll do for like our weekday meals. And then usually near the end of the week, and maybe we'll plan like four or five meals. Cause usually we'll like go get dinner somewhere at like a Thai food restaurant or something one of the other nights. And then usually on the weekend, I'll decide what we're going to make on Sunday. And then I'll just go and like pick stuff up like, Sunday morning or something. Um, in the summer, it's a little bit different. We try to like, we live in a place downtown is right next to where the farmer mark, farmer's market is every Saturday. So in the, in the summer, we just go there every Saturday, get as much stuff as we can from there. And then we'll like order the rest of the stuff from Smith's or whatever. Um, yeah. Is that, 
Does that answer your question? As yeah, far as that answers that. Rules, like, I think we just kind of decide what sounds good to us on Sat on Sunday for the coming week and like, you know, plan a bunch of stuff. We we have like a few things that we cook really regularly, but other than that, I feel like we're probably two out of our four or five meals a week are gonna be like new things that we've never made before. I don't know why. I think we just like, like really enjoy trying new stuff. So we'll do like one or two things that's like we know and we know that it's not going to take us a long time to make it. So if we're like tired one day, we can just whip that up. Um, but then the other ones are going to be kind of new things. I love that. Also, the farmer's market is incredible. I love that. I, I don't go as often as I should because I don't live. I have mm -hmm. been historically lived that close, but that's amazing. Yeah. It's, it, I feel like if I didn't live so close, it's a hard thing to like, you know, like, be like, okay, we're going to plan, we're going to go, we have to find parking, but like living super close, it is, it's so convenient that it's, that we're like, yeah, we got to go because it's just awesome. And it's such a fun experience, like going to the farmer's market and just, that's a genuinely exciting part of the day versus just going to the grocery store, which isn't nice. necessarily a boring part of the day, but it's more exciting at a farmer's market. Yeah. Yes. And like you make friends with like the tomato guy or the peach, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah. So yeah, it's awesome. That's so true. What is the best dish that you've ever eaten? Mmm. I think it's um, okay. There's I'm gonna I'm gonna give two. One is at this uh, restaurant in Salt Lake called Takashi's. It's, uh, it's a sushi restaurant, and it's this thing called um, I, I think they they just call it like the charred sable fish nigiri. So it's just like a piece of rice. And they, on the bottom of the sable fish, they put some like, um, I think it's like ponzu or something. It's just like citrusy paste. And then they put the fish on the like piece of rice and then they like torch it with a blowtorch. So it just like barely chars the outside of it. But then the fit, like sable fish is kind of an oily fish. So then the oils from the fish soak into the rice. It is so good. I could like eat that all day. Like during, during COVID, that was the one, like we were like, as soon as Takashi's opens back up, we are going to go and order. Well, so we did like what, as soon as it opened back up, we ordered like four orders of that and just like, just ate that for a while. <laughs> yeah. That what is, is it a, called again? It's called charred, uh, sable fish nigiri. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's still, well, it's on my list of things I want to try to make. Like it's simple enough that I think maybe I could do it. But yeah, it's amazing. And they do you have a like hot. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> do you have a blowtorch? I okay, yes. My wife gave got me one for like, I think it was like a birthday or something, but she <laughs> forgot to get the like fuel that goes, like the butane. Oh. <laughs> so I need to get I still need to get that. But yeah. So you've never used it? I I haven't used it. Yeah, okay. We have to get you using your blowtorch. This is very exciting. <laughs> I know, and, I, and like I've always wanted to learn how to make like creme brulee and like a bunch of other stuff, or like just crusting like some fish or something. Yeah, that's so fun. That's yeah. really fun. I I'm <laughs> excited about that for you. Yeah. Didn't you say you had a, a second um, favorite dish? Oh yes. Um, okay, my second favorite. I. Um, it was, we had it at this restaurant in Mexico. It was this restaurant by, um, Enrique Olvera, who's like this amazing, amazing Mexican chef. And, um, like if, you're, if you've ever watched chef's table, he has like an episode on chef's table. It's so good. Um, it, it was just a plate with just this almond mole like spread on it mm. and a roasted sweet potato. And then it just came with tortillas. It was like so simple and, and uh, caramelized onions. And you would just Ooh. like mix those together. And it was so, so good. Like the mole was like really, really, really like richly flavored. Lots of like spices and stuff. And like 
I don't know. I, I loved it because it was super delicious, but also just like how simple it was. It was like a potato and like the sauce and it was so good. Wow. Okay. That's very unexpected, but that does sound really good. Yeah. Now that's going to make me want to go on a life mission <laughs> to find that particular yeah. dish. Okay. This is something I'm very curious about because I'm sure like everybody has had their moments of disaster, or, like even of just a mistake. But even though I can't picture it, oh, what is your biggest kitchen disaster? Okay. I know exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is so funny. When um, when my wife and I were first dating, uh, we, it was like our fourth date, I think. And I was like, yeah, come over. We'll like make pasta, right? And so <laughs> she comes over and we're like making some pasta. We were making some like butternut squash ravioli um, and part of making those after you like pull them out of the water you put them in a pan with like hot browned butter mm -hmm. usually you just have to be really careful right because if you splatter any of the butter it can like start a fire and so we're on our oh, first, no. first time I've ever cooked for her and I pull the I, I have like my hot brown butter and I just like wasn't fully paying attention, right? Because I'm like kind of nervous and stuff. And so I pull, I pull the ravioli out and I put it in the pan before it had finished draining. And so it like immediately, like <laughs> some like butter went into the flames and it started a big fire. Like, <laughs> oh my. And she like screamed and like ran away. And I just like, like turned the fire off and like put a lid on it. Um, it ended up being fine, but that's probably mine just because in that month, like, you know, years later, she was like, yeah, honestly, I thought maybe you didn't actually know how to cook and you were doing this <laughs> the first time. And so, yeah, luckily oh. it came, you know. Was that the first time that you had like really cooked together? Yes, it was. This is the first time I've ever cooked I started a huge fire, which has never happened since. It's just so funny to me that it happened on our, like, Like, of course, time. of course it had to happen the first time yes. on your, like, fourth date that you cooked yes. together. That was the food, you said it turned out fine. The food was fine. Yeah. It survived. Yeah. That's pretty was, impressive. Yeah, because it just, like, it actually was maybe the best, like, one I'd ever done because, like, it's the best part of putting it in the hot butter is it kind of like makes this like leathery sort of like crust on the outside of the ravioli. Um, and that was the best it had ever been. So, you know, I, I haven't really topped it since. I think I just need to light it on fire now every time. And just use your blowtorch now. Yeah, use the blowtorch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's so great. Obviously, that's a success story at the end of the day because you and your wife ended up together and now... She knows, you know, a, a legitimate chef, but that's hilarious. Okay. Let's do two more questions. One, what is one recipe that you just, it's your comfort recipe. You always go back to it and you have it memorized. Um, probably the puttanesca that I think I mentioned earlier. So it's like a simple pasta. It's partially my comfort food because like I mentioned before, like we can just get everything from our pantry. We don't have to go to the grocery store. Um, or if we do like, there's this store on our block, it's called Caputo's. It's like a delicatessen store. So they have like, you know, canned tomatoes and like olives and stuff. So we can just go there if, if we're missing anything. Um, so that's, that's probably, that's probably my comfort to like go to, thing um that i've memorized so that's a can do you want me to give the recipe yeah yeah exactly okay sure so it's a can of like whole plum tomatoes um and you just when you use the tomatoes you don't use like the juices in there you just like pull the tomatoes themselves out and put them in the pan you just put them in whole and then while they're cooking you'll kind of like break them up it's so it's a can of that it's like I don't really know about like picture a really large handful of like olives and I use uh, Tajaska olives. 
they're the best. They're kind of like bitter and they're packed in their own like olive oil. So when they crush them, they release their olive oil and then they just pack them in their own olive oil, which is also really, really good. Um, so those, and then it's um, some capers, maybe like a tablespoon of capers and a tin of anchovies and a pound of dried spaghetti is best, like a thick spaghetti or bucatini is good. And then in like a quarter cup of olive oil. So like quite a bit of olive oil um, and one garlic clove that's sliced. So you like start heating up the olive oil and then you put in the garlic and then you put in the olives and the capers and the tomatoes and you let those kind of like start getting soft and stuff. And then meanwhile, you cook your pasta. And then once the sauce is kind of like soft and everything's like mixed together, you'll finish cooking the pasta in that. And that's it. And it's so good. Yeah. Mm. I know what I'm making this week. <laughs> yeah, for real. That sounds delicious. Amazing, yeah. Okay, last question to wrap things up. How has cooking influenced your life or like what's one of your main applications from cooking to other areas of life, if that makes sense as a question. Mm, interesting. I think the main way it's influenced my life is it's the way um, that um, I really like to like meet people or like socialize with people. So like if we're making like some new friends or something, the first thing we do is just like invite them over for dinner and um, and like cook for them and, you know, hang out. And, and, uh, so I think that's probably the biggest way it's influenced my life. Apparently helped me like meet my wife. Right. Luckily I didn't like burn the house. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that for sure. And, and it also has gotten me into a bunch of other things that I really enjoy. So like, I think I really started to enjoy wine because I first enjoyed cooking and then like um i started to really enjoy traveling because now like when we travel we travel just to like go to like some restaurant we want to try or like you know go to somewhere that has like some food we want to try so it's affected me in that way too um what was the second half of the question oh, like how, how you... how my other parts of my life yeah um I mean, I guess you have to follow like a procedure, right? So like when I'm uh, harping away on, on all of, uh, all of our employees on following procedures, that's, that's all <laughs> it's cooking. So, um, I guess it affected me in that way too. That makes sense. And the more that you follow a procedure, the more it becomes like part of like you memorize it, like this me recipe that you just memorized. And so it kind of could become a way of operating if you're ingraining certain values or ways of living into your yeah. into your life yeah. that's my own spin on that but <laughs> all right well thanks bobby uh yeah. bobby has a blog it is salt to taste cooking.com yeah. and you should go make one of bobby's recipes and tag monitor base in it if you post it on instagram yes definitely all right well thank you so much yeah thank you <laughs> have a good rest of your day everyone yeah bye